Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoints Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. You've heard their point, now listen to the counterpoint. Welcome to the Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. We are coming at you on May 26, 2021. Uh, lots of crazy stuff going on ever since we started the show a little over a year ago, <laughs> just nonstop. But before we jump into any of that, let me introduce you to our panel. In our upper left-hand corner, we have our screaming eagle of freedom, Tim Everett. He is a pilot in the state of California. In our upper right-hand corner, we have Leon the Word Brathwaite, last word in liberty. He is a retired engineer in the state of California. My name is Jason McPhee, and I'll be your host today. Getting into the uh, Biden and jobs, there was kind of a a recent sort of a collapse in expectations that they had. They were they were kind of expecting that they were going to have a million new jobs coming out to announce uh, in their jobs report. And when the numbers came out, uh, everything sort of fell flat for them. It was about a quarter of a million jobs. And they just couldn't seem to understand what was going on. Of course, a lot of um, conservatives uh, and libertarians might have told them if you pay people to stay home, they might not show up to work, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which yeah. was kind of a shocker for those guys. But uh, um, and I'm going to actually pull up a few uh, statistics for this discussion. Uh, we have the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So, we're, you know, we're not just uh, pulling your leg or blowing or blowing smoke, if you want to say that one. Yeah. So here we go. So. Uh, this is the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, came out March 2021, and it shows um, essentially uh, these job openings uh, rates, and uh, essentially they're going up, So, uh, which is you know kind of what you'd expect when you're opening the economy up. And, um, uh, and the uh, <clears throat> hires and seasonal separations is over here on the other side and that's essentially showing um here that uh, uh we have i guess a uh th th there was a sort of a spike at the beginning of the whole pandemic and now it's sort of a it way dropped off and and now we're we're just uh i don't know well it seems like we're in a bit of a malaise then uh, these, uh, th this particular uh, BLS uh, is from April of 2021, and it shows um, the unemployment uh, status. And this is uh, specifically showing here that we had this spike in unemployment around the beginning of the pandemic, and it's falling off, but it's sort of uh, at much higher level, around 6% than the uh, less than 4% that we had before the pandemic. And um, on, on this one, uh, as well, we can see that uh, uh, the non-farm payroll uh, drops off and then it's starting to work its way back up, but uh, it's still well short. So I just wanted to have some real numbers up here just so that, uh, um, you know, our discussion is pinned with something. Uh, but anyways, uh, so do you guys have uh, um, any thoughts on on any of this? It just, it just goes to show, you know, free this and free that. It all adds up to big disincentive, disincentive for people to work. The government comes along. First of all, they broke our kneecaps. That's the first thing they did. Okay, they bust our kneecaps. And then they come now and they're going to give us a crutch. And that crutch is dependency upon government laggers. We are seeing it is now more profitable for people to stay at home than to go to work. So are we now shocked? That we only had 250, well, 225, um, 225,000 people enter the labor market when they were expecting a million. Why are we shocked? Everybody was telling, every every economist, probably except Paul Krugman, was telling, was saying publicly, these unemployment payments that we are making, though some people needed it, but the massive amounts that we are paying out, it was cre it is. They are creating disincentives to work. And right now, this thing is going to go on until September. So don't expect any changes in this thing until after these things run out. It is more profitable to stay home, to sit on your behind, than to go to work. And this, we can thank our beautiful, wonderful government for this. Well, not only the beautiful, wonderful government, but the beautiful, wonderful Democrat government. Because if there's, 
if there's a, a disincentive going on here, it's to vote Republican next time because when you vote Democrat, you get to stay home for free and <laughs> paid to do it. So uh, <clears throat> that could be a motivation for the Democratic Party to, uh, you know, just give a little bit more of this. Uh, I mean, it's not coming from the DNC or anybody privately. It's all coming from, uh, again, the, the Federal Reserve is buying up the the debt of the United States that, and it's not paid from taxes. It's a hundred percent being paid from debt. So um, it's important to keep this in mind, I think. Uh, and so the Democrats get a, a free um, campaign uh, slogan to work on next, next uh, in the next campaigns upcoming. Well, actually, it's the same old slogan, right? Free stuff. Yeah, free stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Free stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's it. If you vote for us, you get free stuff. There you go. That's the slogan. They should just put that on their on their whole uh, campaign. I mean, because that's that's what it really is. I mean, they may try to sugarcoat it in other ways. And, um, you know, there's there's no sweat off anybody's brow because uh, it's all coming. From, well, it's sweat off somebody's brow, but somebody in the future has to pay for all the debt eventually one way or another. And so here we go. You, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out, too, was the trend here. And I'm not sure. Can you guys see my mouse moving on the yeah. uh, chart? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. So if, if you notice it, you, you, we hit this, you know, pit, essentially a crater, um, you know, of uh I guess a drop in jobs, which you know corresponds to the spike in unemployment there. But um, th this is uh, you know right around the time of, of April, right when the lockdown started. Right, so you expect people going home; they're not uh, going to work uh, by government decree. Uh, remember, this wasn't just like the economy naturally responded this way. This was government edict. But as as the pandemic, uh, you know. Um, went on and government started to adjust. Uh, you know, Trump was certainly pushing uh, for the economy to open up more. We actually see that, you know, the trend is starting back up. What's alarming is that after Trump is is uh, not, not elected and Biden's elected, it stays relatively flat, even though he continues to drop trillions of dollars into the economy at rates uh, you know, of money expansion that we've just never seen before as as a world. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I, I, unless you lived in Zimbabwe, I guess. <laughs> yeah, where, true, where, true. where even the homeless are, are billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. And, they, so much. and they walk around with all their resources in their pocket or a wheelbarrow. Exactly, right. yes, wheelbarrow. <laughs> the best thing for wheelbarrows. <laughs> so, yeah, he's trying to uh, up wheelbarrows so that you can have uh, something other than a wallet to carry your, your newfound yeah. wealth around. <laughs> of course, of course, yes. <laughs> so, but, it, yeah, it's just uh, this trend because, you know, we, we have these, you know, Democrats insisting that their policies are working and that government, you know, staying at the helm, uh, you know, making command and control decisions, printing more money, dumping more into the economy is a good thing. And and yet, you know, it's uh, I, I think maybe it's falling flat on them at the moment. And it'll be interesting to see how, you know, if, if, if they're able to paint this through their media arm, I guess, the, the mainstream media, <laughs> with the, the, the left wing of the Democrat Party at this point. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, but, if, if they're able to sugarcoat this as somehow this is just a new norm or something and, and uh, just hide the reality from us. Uh, you know. but, they are, but they are sugarcoating it, you know, because Nancy Pelosi is talking about, oh, this, the, the, some of the numbers are showing how much, how much the, um, is needed and we need to pass somebody, well, some of the other programs, the other trillion dollar programs that they want to pass, that they want to inflict upon us. And Nancy Pelosi is talking about, oh, this is so needed for, for American jobs and families and all this all this sort of nonsense. You see, this thing all goes back, all things go back to the government making choices as to what is essential and what is not essential. They could lock us down, they could uh, break our knees and then tell us, well, here's a crutch to get us, to, to, to get us going again. But what they are doing, and Tim is correct, is they are creating this sense of entitlement, creating this sense of dependency. And if and, and and if this continues, they will be in power forever because the government is always here to save you. And, they, and they're always going to save us. 
But look at how, look at what saving looks like. <laughs> look at the inner cities of America and you'll see what saving looks like. When these people save you, you end up living in South Side of Chicago or some other place equivalent to it. Crime and drugs and poor public schools are what you're going to have to live with. That is their idea of saving us. Yeah. Uh, here, here's your free tent and wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the plan in a lot of big uh, blue cities. But, you know, it, it, with all this money printing, I guess that brings us on to our next topic, too, as well. I, is that, um, I, oh, I would sorry. just... I would just like to say something about the last. I think the reason why they've flattened out with uh, the unemployment uh, being uh, higher and the employment being lower than the previous norms was is just because the people that were affected with the low wage, uh, uh, low income people that were affected are still uh, staying home because the amount of money they're giving them is enough to make it worthwhile. So I, I think it just shows that segment of the population. Um, and, uh, you know, because they're not going back to work is indicative of, you know, just they're, they're right at the margin between, um, working or getting government handout, uh, being adequate, you know, like yeah. for somebody like, you know, somebody in the higher, uh, income levels, that's, you know, that wouldn't be adequate, you know, they well, would immediately go back. Well, to bolster what you're saying, I mean, there's been stories of fast food places paying people just to come in for an interview, exactly. so, yeah. which is unheard exactly. of. I mean, when I was a kid applying for right. my first job at a fast food place, uh, they certainly weren't paying me just to show up and, and talk yeah. to them. Yes, to talk to them, exactly. exactly. Which is, is kind of unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, you, you hear about bonuses, you know, some of these NFL players or NBA players, they have bonuses, sign-in bonuses and all that kind of stuff and things like that. Now we're hearing about signing bonuses or sign or or bonuses for just for interviewing and all those sort of things. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but I can see why it is happening. And Tim is correct. Tim is correct. That the low skill workers, low, 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 low wage workers are really coming out uh, like a bandit in, in these um with these unemployment um, payments that are being made. Because I think in one of those articles, Jason, that you sent with, with this for discussion of this topic, I think Reason Magazine or somebody calculated that people are now averaging about with, with, with the federal and the state unemployment payments, people are making at the equivalent of about $15 an hour. So if you're making below $15 an hour, you have every incentive to stay home and take the money. It's, it's like yeah. a paid vacation almost that you would have yeah, never imagined. Know. But the, the sad thing is, though, is that, you know, when you take a hit to your, when you're young and you take a hit to your employment record, that's not good. I mean, you wind up having a gap that you have to explain in the future. Exactly. And, and it's also time, too, that your skills are, are not growing. And that's that's what leads people to, you know, it, it's funny, you know, when uh, Democrats are big on pushing for the price floor of the minimum wage, and, and most economists will tell you when you ask them neutrally, are price floors or price ceilings good? In other words, price controls. They'll say no. And, and I mean, that's almost across the board. Then some of them that, you know, tend to favor the left, they'll sort of waffle on issues like, uh, you know, price floors for minimum wage and stuff, because that tends to favor their 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 group. But but as far as uh, uh, these these issues, uh, you know, the majority of, of people when they go into the labor force, they're not protected by that price price for I, literally it's only a few percent. It's uh, under five percent of people who actually um, uh, are at the price floor. Almost everybody else is making more than minimum wage to some degree. And yes. what causes you to make more is that you're worth more to your employer. I mean, they have to pay you more. If the employer just had some kind of a, uh, a complete power in the market, then we'd all be making minimum wage, right? I mean, they would just pay exactly. us the exact minimum that they could yeah. pay us. But the idea yes. that over 95% of employees don't make minimum wage, they make over that then that shows you that it's the skills that are really driving. It's that competition. And when you have a gap in your labor skills as you're, as you're coming up, that is going to uh, deter your long-term growth and those skills that you're going to develop. That's going to hold you back from where you're going <clears> to <throat> get to in the long run. So I mean, well, that's, maybe, that's no, maybe they'll, they'll t make it a positive. They'll say uh, to their future employer, look, I made an executive decision about, you know, whether I should work and make the same amount or just take a handout from the government. <laughs> yeah, they'll you see know, you can do math. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and put it, put it on there. 
hey, hey, future boss, what would you have done? <laughs> hey, I guess. Yeah, that's a good math. Dad. <laughs> yes, I use I use those wonderful math skills that I learned in in high school that, uh, to make that decision. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, from whatever that new methodology is called. I'm telling you, don't don't search for the right answer. You know, you know yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of all this distortion, all this extra money floating around, okay. that's leading us to another topic, and that's inflation. And uh, uh, this particular uh, graph, um, uh, let's see where it, uh, uh, some site called TradingEconomics.com, they're pulling their data here from the. Uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics right here. But you can see here the trend uh, in inflation. And I mean, it is starting to ramp up and really heat up. And, you know, when when Trump was leaving office, it wasn't growing that high. I mean, we had some inflation kicking in because of all the money from the, the pandemic and the lower productivity that was happening in the country at the same time. But, uh, you know, things are starting to get, you know, make people a little bit worried. And people like Warren Buffett have come out and said, hey, our company, uh, Berkshire, ha ha Berkshire ha Hathaway, we are seeing uh, costs across the board going up for us. Um, and they're trying to sound the alarm bells out there. But, you know, these people like the Krugmans and others, they say, no, don't worry about it. You know, this is just the way the economy should be. You know, it's just some slack and, you know, we'll we'll see it all come back down. And so this is a kind of a little bit of a test here to see what happens over this next uh, um few months what do you guys think about this a time to, uh, to panic <laughs> if i could if i could just start it off um and, and i'm gonna then play devil's advocate so what they're gonna say is uh well there was a, a bunch of uh, loss in productivity during 2020 so some of this and, and some of it is attributable to lack of products in the uh, marketplace so uh you know it's just supply it's just demand curve stuff uh, you have a demand, uh, even if it's flat, and you have lowering supply, then the prices are going to go up. I mean, that's sim simple stuff. And part of that is there, too. Uh, true. Um, and, and so we may, you know, we're going to watch this. Uh, you know, that 4.2 is a quarter there. So, I mean, <laughs> you extrapolate that out. That's that's a lot of inflation if it continues. So we're going to... A pretty steep trend, too, as well. I mean, yeah, it that's go right. higher. That's yeah, right. I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to. <laughs> I Wow. What was this point one? Um, <laughs> I like that one. Uh, and, the, and the Keynesians are going to go, oh, my God, we might have deflation. We can't have that. Oh, oh, the horrors. Oh, you mean huh, my TV set is going to be less uh, costly in the in, in the future? I'll never I buy it. I won't stand for that. <laughs> oh, I can't stand it. Oh, yeah. I'll never buy another computer because they're always cheaper and more powerful. And so I'll just I'll just keep my old piece of junk and uh, and just live with it. You know, my God, I might lose out on a deal in six months. You know, I mean, it's just you now that's Keynesian thinking, though. Idiotic, if you ask me. But uh, sticky wages yeah, issue. That's yeah, what sticky, always yeah, on. yeah, yeah, sticky. Yeah, stick this one time. And so uh, the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that and uh, expecting there to be some fluctuations and eventually they're going to have to um, just stop with the nonsense. Well, it's not nonsense, but they're going to have to stop blaming it on lack of production. Okay. Cause production levels will go up and um, it will af affect the inflation rate for sure. But uh at least on certain things, but uh, you know, it, let's let's watch and see. I mean, if it's in, in the three, four, five percent range um, throughout the next um, two years, moving forward, I, I think we can, you know, maybe finally say that, hey, guess what? You know, all that money printing is yes. uh, coming back uh, to roost. Yes. Well, quite quite frankly, if it was if it's only three or four percent, I think we're getting off light. I'm I'm a little yeah. worried about that we're going to see potentially the double yeah. digit inflation of the seventies. Right. So that's, that's uh, and, and the yeah. early and the early eighties too. The early eighties too. Yeah, we had double digits <laughs> in the early eighties. Yeah, but you know, but but to be fair, I mean, there's tons of, of things that that affect that. Uh, you know, it's it's not we're not in in a vacuum, but. You know, the, this is an experiment where that's never been done before. I mean, yeah, we've had Zimbabwe and all that kind of stuff. None of this has had the type of uh, situation where the Federal Reserve 
has uh, so much flexibility with with uh, the dollar being the reserve currency throughout the world and all, all this demand on the dollar. Uh, so, you know, they, they think that they can get away with darn near anything, and they are definitely plumbing the depths to test that theory. So... Uh, you know, I, I welcome this as, you know, let's yeah, let's test your theory. You know, how far can you push it until you go into double digit inflation or maybe triple digit inflation? OK, and then then let's talk and we'll see what happens. But Milton, Milton Friedman always said this this money printing, <clears throat> this expansion, this artificial expansion of of the money supply will eventually catch up with us with inflation. And I think he, he, this is I mean, if we had to go by his, his theories, uh, if he, there's one of his books that he wrote, he wrote about about this very phenomenon. I mean, he, he's turning out to be right that we are seeing the inflation that have been that is being um, hoisted upon us by this constant printing of money, this so-called quantitative easing that's been going on for, for I don't know the last what three or four years now, I, I think. But eventually, it has to catch up with us. It has to catch up with us, and I. I think this is the first sign of it. This is the first real sign of it. But I hope not. I really do. I hope not. Well, you know, the, the other thing is this is what the government's been doing. It's like a double whammy, uh, like when you would have a war. Because essentially, when you have a war, your production, uh, in, in some ways, your production of real goods, anyways, is going down. I mean, you may be producing more bullets and boats, maybe, but you're not necessarily uh, producing goods that people want to consume, while at the same time, um, you're you're actually inflating the money supply usually to pay for the war. And here yes. we're, we're sort of yes. inflating the money supply and we're telling people to stay home so and not produce anything. So it's uh, it's kind of crazy, but um, uh, well, central planning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah there, there's there's a, the, the, whole, the whole war thing. If you're comparing World War II, uh, the, the, the problem with that is that, yeah, people stay home. They don't consume. So they save their money. So uh, what you have... And they also, if, if you're going to talk about comparing this to World War II, you have to realize that the, that money was not printed, most of it. Some of it was, but most of it they got from war bonds. Remember? All the true. Americans That's that yeah. said massive amounts of savings. They were saving tw uh, 25% on average. Uh, the savings rates were really high in the 30s and 40s, and then boom, uh, uh, so you, you had a lot of pent up uh, savings to to draw from. So that's old money, what I call old money. It wasn't new money. All this stuff we have now, all this debt today is brand or not all of it, but darn near all of it is brand new money, new money. And oh, boy, we really went long on that one. Unfortunately, we didn't get to our crony capitalism one that we keep saving, and I guess we'll have to push that back, the Foxconn story and, and okay. Uh, yeah. okay. expensive okay. government jobs. But let's get to another uh, um, kind of issue of, of government craziness, and that's in our knucklehead noise patrol here. And uh, gosh, there we go. There's our knucklehead noise patrol. Sound. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, let me... Uh, Move over. I was going to show the image. So we have uh, this time uh, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, <laughs> and um, she was recently uh, uh, told reporters she says that she thinks uh, Chicago reporters are too white. <laughs> I guess that's what she's saying. Uh, she says <laughs> that uh, she doesn't like the complexion of what she's seeing when she goes to do interviews. And so she's saying that, uh, you know, uh, I guess her press uh, uh, people are telling uh, the the uh, press that she's not only going to be accepting interviews from people of color. So she won't just accept <laughs> interviews from anyone. And uh, the specific quote that she gave Lightfoot gave was diversity and inclusion is imperative across all institutions, including media. This is exactly why I'm being intentional about prioritizing media requests from people of color reporters on the occasion uh, of the two year anniversary of my inauguration as mayor of this great city. So, yeah, that's okay, the can I, be the can right I start? Yes. Well, I, I you're not the start. right color. We got to let Leo first on this. Be but, careful. Yeah. Be careful in this discussion that nobody called me a, a person of color, but go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, because Leon's going to get the last word, and I'm going to okay. go real quick. Uh, you know, so as a libertarian, I cheer on Lori here because I'm all about small government and small government, unless, you know, they're breaking a law. They may be breaking a couple laws. I'm not sure, but let's assume they're not. And hey, let's throw it up on the wall and see what sticks. So Lori, don't just stop at the whole, you know, it's got, it's got to be a person of color and it's got to be a woman. Don't stop there, Lori. You are a uh, gay uh, le or lesbian, uh, a mayor. So you need to only talk to, and I mean, you better put your foot down, Lori, and only talk to black, female, lesbian people that ask you <laughs> questions there at, uh, from the press court office, okay? <laughs> and, and double down on that, and you better be strong about it, okay? So if I'm going to be the one that's uh, the head of cheese making decisions at the media outlet in Chicago, I'm going to, I don't care where I have to find them. If I have to go to the, the lady that cleans, that empties the garbage every night, I'm going to put her in front of Lori Lightfoot as long as she meets those, uh, what is that, um, uh, person of color, female, and uh this, their sexual preference. There's three. They got to meet those three things. And anybody else, I don't care how yeah. qualified they are, they're out of the picture. Okay. They have to, they have to hit the inter intersectionality jackpot. Exactly. <laughs> if they I want an interview see, with Lori. <laughs> yes. So I'm in favor of this, Lori. Go for it and go hard and go long and go big. Okay. What do you say, Leon? No, you know, um, <laughs> on, on a serious on a serious note though. You know what is disturbing about all of this? It is it is it is good enough, it is bad enough that this woman have lay out this, this racist nonsense and have, have is infecting our society with further divisions than we already have. What is most disturbing about this is the acceptance of this kind of racism in our society. George Wallace said, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And we are now living that vision where we have elected officials. Now listen, this is a government official endorsing discrimination. That's what she's doing. She's endorsing discrimination, endorsing racism. And nobody is making us think of this. Could you imagine what would have happened if a white mayor somewhere said I am only going to speak to white reporters, we, would not be, we wouldn't hear the end of that. They would have been calling for his head. They would have probably want to lynch him. They probably would have want to make sure he's kicked out of office. But Laurie Lightfoot is female. She's black and a lesbian. So she has all the right characteristics so she could get away with racism. She could get away with this sort of discrimination. This is madness on steroids. Yeah. And we better do something about these things. Otherwise, we wouldn't recognize the society that we are living in pretty soon. Well, even though we may never hear the end of it, if that happens, we've reached the end of our show. <laughs> so that's going to have to be the end of it. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for joining, uh, joining us for the show. And we will see you next time. Stay